Presented by Caltech. So we've been talking about light waves. Not that they're fundamentally, any, or electromagnetic waves in general, not that they're fundamentally different than any of the other waves that we have been talking about. Uh, they have a little bit of an added complexity in that it's a vector quantity that it's a wave in, but uh, uh, otherwise they travel at some speed. You can write down plane waves for them just like you can for some of our other waves. And these are transverse waves like uh, most of our examples on the string were transverse waves. We could make the string go either way we wanted, so the string has a polarization too. So the polarization actually isn't new either. Uh, but there are some uh, especially interesting phenomena in electromagnetic waves, and I want to go through some of these with the uh, demonstrations here. So the first thing I want to do remember where that is just go back to this simple one here uh, we used it before to show that um, we got reflection and transmission at an interface but uh, we also just did the calculation last time about uh, refraction and how far and, and what the angle of refraction is here. So we derived Snell's law from the consideration of the velocity changing in the material. And so you can see that happening here. The wave comes in, it goes up, and it comes out at a higher level than it came in at. And so if we just measured the, uh, measured the change in angle, or if we knew how far this was and so, so how far up this went from there, we could just measure the index of refraction in that way, knowing Snell's law. <clears throat> so I just wanted to quickly remind you of that. <clears throat> so index of refraction and Snell's law, you can actually uh, we derived it by considering the, um, the change in velocity uh, as you change the index of refraction. You could also use this uh, concept called Huygens' principle to derive Snell's law. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. We also talked about the Michelson interferometer, and so I have one here. <coughs> So this is the interferometer here. <clears throat> we just have the laser light coming in through a lens, through a diaphragm, uh, just an open circle aperture. It uh, comes and hits a piece of uh, glass or quartz or whatever it is here. And the main, ref the main so this is actually a beam splitter, so it's got a half silvered side to it, which happens to be the back side on this one. Um, so there's one path where the light comes through, goes through the quartz or glass, hits the back surface, some of it gets reflected, gets reflected onto this mirror here, goes back, and some of it goes back through the glass and ends up going up to the wall up there. So. That's actually three traversals of this piece of glass for the beam that goes this direction. Then there's another path where it actually goes through this first, first element. It goes through a blank element here, which is the compensator here, um, to make the same number of paths through, through glass in both directions. So it goes through the compensator, hits another mirror, goes through, back through the compensator, and then bounces off the surface of that first element. And so what happens is it's a monochromatic light source, coherent light source. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and the two paths aren't exactly the same, and you get an interference pattern uh, up there. Um, so I can change the distance of one of these mirrors, and you can see it's very delicate. You know, I go, I, <clears throat> basically I'm changing it by a, a, a wavelength at a time, and, and, and you can see it's a, that it varies a lot. Um, the fringes in this are also part of the interference um, <clears throat> because I've got apertures going on here. And so we're going to talk about single slit and double slit. And so that's, that's what's uh, responsible for the fact that we've actually got fringes here. But uh, uh, you, can, you can see as we adjust in, in that center spot, say, we can adjust it so that the center spot is dark or so that it's bright. So we've gone kind of half a wavelength between those two when I move the mirror. If I block one of these paths, the whole interference pattern goes away. So it is the two paths that are interfering, causing this interference. I could put a piece of glass in one of the paths. And you see that the interference pattern is still there, but it has moved. It's kind of gone down to the bottom of this. If I uh, tip this around the other way, it's kind of gone up to a different position. Move it around different places and move it to different places. So I'm just reorienting this piece of glass. That tells me that this piece of glass isn't flat. moving things around, so it's not a very perfect piece of glass. So it's a very delicate in, instrument for, for telling small changes in path length. And you'll have a problem on your homework uh, to use such a device to measure an index of refraction of a gas. <coughs> so that's the... <clears throat> Michelson interferometer. <clears throat> so we're talking about polarization now. And I uh, just go back to this for a second. Um, on the board, I did a recap of where we were last week. We have uh, the electric and magnetic fields are both transverse to the direction of, of the wave. Uh, and you, if you know what the electric field is, you actually can calculate what the magnetic field is, so it's not an independent quantity. But there are two independent polarizations that the electric field could have. It could either be pointing like I've got it, or it could be pointing the other direction, where B is pointing now. Uh, and so that's the uh, two degrees of freedom in the polarization where, say, if, if I take the XY basis, uh, I can have the electric field pointing along X, or I can have it pointing along Y, or I could take linear combinations of those two to make it point in different other directions in the XY plane. Uh, but I can also add a phase in making that linear combination such that <clears throat> I get something that we call circular polarization, where the electric field for any given time just rotates ro rotate. I mean, if, I, if for any given time there's a, a wave in space that's ro that where the polarization vector, where it points, depends on where I am along the wave. Or for any given point in space, it's just going around in a circle in time. You can look at it either way. <clears throat> so I have a demonstration of some polarizers here. Um, <clears throat> So I've got a polarizer in the y direction here and a polarizer in the x direction here. Uh, and that's supposed to be no light, but somehow blue light gets through. I can contrast that. I can change this polarizer in the x direction to be in the y direction. And you see I get lots of light. So when it's just blue, it's, you know, the, the two are crossed. So, so what I'm doing is with the first, so it's unpolarized light that's coming out of this projector. But once I put it in 
to this first um, filter, it's polarizing that light. It's only letting light through that's polarized vertically. So the electric field is going up and down like that. Uh, and then once I have this polarized light, if I put a polarizer that only lets light through in the other direction, I'm not going to get any light. But if I align them up, I'm going to get all the light through that came through this first polarizer. So I can do some other things with this. <coughs> I can put a third polarizer in between. I could line it up. And so all the light's going through all three. I can block things. Let me block. Let me go ahead and block without that additional one. Let me block that that way. And then put this one in between. Line these two up. So the lights still block these two polarizers in the same direction. So the one's blocking them, and both are blocking them. If I put it up this way, these two are lined up. And the light's still blocked because it's just letting vertical polarization through, and the horizontal polarization isn't getting through this. There's no horizontal polarization to get through this third one. But if I turn this to, say, 45 degrees, I'm getting this light that's polarized vertically through a horizontal polarizer. So how did I do that? I mean, I got, I've got vertically polarized light coming in, and there's a horizontal polarizer here. So the vertically polarized light shouldn't get through the horizontal polarization. Doesn't get through. But when I put this other polarizer in that's turned at 45 degrees, I get light through. Maybe not the same intensity, so there's some details of intensity to worry about. So what's the point here? The point is that I'm taking this vertically polarized light, and with this polarizer at 45 degrees, so that vertically polarized light That vertically polarized light, so the electric field is going back and forth like that. I put it through a polarizer at 45 degrees. Well, this, a vector in this direction, I can decompose into a vector in this direction plus a vector in this direction. And so what I've done is I've effectively changed my basis with this. And so now I'm letting through this. And I'm blocking this. So I end up with just light polarized in this direction. And then that gets through the third polarizer that's horizontal because this is just a vector sum of these two vectors. And so this one is allowed. So this one gets through the third polarizer. <clears throat> so I was just about uh, to get into the subject of, of how we make circular polarization last time. So what I have here is something called a quarter wave plate. It's, it's a birefringent material that has indices of refraction that are different in the two directions, horizontal versus vertical, or whatever angle I put it at. The index of refraction is different. And so that means that the, the speed as the light goes through it is different in one direction from another direction. And so that introduces a phase shift in one direction with respect to another. And that's how we can actually get circular polarization. So I start out with uh, a linear polarization. I put it through this at some angle. 
if I pick the angle right, I can get circular polarization. So I have put that in there. So I can, you can see that it's, so all I'm doing is I'm rotating it. So I'm rotating the two axes so that the indices of refraction go like this. <clears throat> if I line up, so, so I've got it oriented now so that the index of refractions are lined up in the vertical and horizontal direction. <clears throat> and so it's not generating circular polarization now. It's just, give, it's just sending the same vertical polarization through, through this element, and I can block it with the other, with the horizontal polarizer. <clears throat> Let's try this. But now let me rotate this. I want to rotate it so that the axis is at 45 degrees. That's probably about right. So now let me now let me change the linear polar, polarizer, the, the analyzer is sometimes called the, 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 this third element. Let me change its linear polarization. Or, so it's vertical now, it's horizontal now. You know, it doesn't matter what I do. The intensity of the light's not really changing. So independent of how I'm adjusting my polar, polarizer here, the intensity is staying the same. That's saying that what's coming into it is not linear polarization because there should be a preferred direction if there were linear polarization. Instead, it's circular polarization. And the circular polarization is sampling all linear polarizations, depending on the instant in time. So, so it doesn't matter where I put this. You know, it's, as far as I can tell here, it's as if I put unpolarized light through, but it's not. It's got a linear polarization here. I've just adjusted it with a crossed, uh, with, with the indices of refraction at 45 degrees to get circular polarization out of this. And so we can analyze this a bit more carefully, uh, which I think you'll do in your homework. <clears throat> OK, so <clears throat> there's another thing we're going to be talking about, and that's uh, going through apertures. Uh, single slits and double slits and multiple slits going up to many slits. Uh, so basically we're shining a beam of light on a little opening, a little vertical opening. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about it. We haven't really talked about it yet, but I want to do the demonstration now so you see what the effects are and then we can understand them when we go through the analysis. So I have another laser here, a little laser. Um, and I'm pointing it at, um, at a slit here. And I, can and I can adjust the width of the slit. So there's the slit closed. So there's no light getting through. So you're supposed to look up there in case you didn't notice. Um, so now the slit is just barely open. So we get a rather wide... Uh, spot there, the center. If I make the slit open some more, I can see that the width of that center spot decreases, and I am getting some additional spots in the wings. And so this is the phenomena of diffraction. If I open it way up, it's effective, you know, you, you can still see it, but, to, but the, the, the centers, almost all of the light is going into the center spot. But then you can get some nice diffraction patterns where you get a bright center spot, but you get 
uh, less intense side spots that are well uh, distinguished from each other. And this all has to do with, with the phases of the light interfering with each other to give you bright and dark spots depending on the distances involved, which we'll, we'll analyze. I mean, there's nothing else going on here but a light source and a slit. And you can get rather interesting phenomena. So that's the single slit. We're also going to talk about uh, double slits. And uh, I, I have that here as well. I move, so I'm just moving the laser beam over to where the double slits are. So this looks a lot like the single slit. And it certainly has a single slit aspect to it. But if you look carefully, you'll see there's substructure. This is not just one spot for the center spot there. It's a bunch of little spots, closely spaced, in the context of this larger slot, uh, spot. Let me see if I can do. So I, you know, I have different samples here. Here's a different. So the, I've, the, I've got two slits, and I can adjust the separation of the slits. And I can adjust the opening, the, the, the size of each slit. And so that's what the, the different cases are here. And so we can understand, uh, once we've gone through the math, what the different sizes are here. We could even make measurements that would tell us what the sizes are. Let's see, there should be. So this is one. So the center spot's not terribly wide. So that suggests um, something about the sizes. Here's another one. So the difference here is the pattern of the smaller spots. So the smaller spots are re relatively far apart here. They're relatively close here. And we'll understand why that, where that difference comes from. There's a third one. So now the, the center spots are relatively, the little spots are relatively close, but we got a wide uh, main spot. And here we've got a wide main spot, and the smaller spots are actually farther apart now. And so that's just going through different sizes, different separations of the slits, and different sizes of the slits. And we're going to be able to understand all the whole pattern. Okay, uh, any questions about the observations? We're going to talk about them now. <clears throat> so let me start by uh, saying some more about polarization. The phenomena of birefringence, for example, in a calcite crystal, is that uh, <coughs> different directions in the material have different indices of refraction. <coughs> that is, the material is no longer isotropic. We started our whole discussion of EM waves by saying we're going to take an isotropic medium. But now we're going to violate that assumption. And so it, in effect, you really have to go back to our derivations and see what changes and what stays the same. Uh, so you go back to Maxwell's equations and work it all out again. The, the thing that changes is that the speed of light is, is now different in the two different directions. OK. okay. <clears throat> 
Uh, so V equals C over N. Uh, is different in the two directions. So I might have a block of material <clears throat> that's some thickness D, say, And I've oriented it such that, um, such that one index of refraction n sub 1 is on this direction, which I'll take to be the x direction. So x, y, no, oh, y has to point down if I do it this way. y and z, I'm going to have z go through the material. And n2 will be the index in this direction, along the y direction. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so I'm, put, I'm shining my light through it in the z direction, which is uh, perpendicular to the face of the object. Uh, n1 is the index in the x, x direction, and n2 is the index in the y direction. <clears throat> Let's let delta n the n2 minus n1. I'm going to assume that n2 is bigger than n1, just for the sake of simplicity. <clears throat> so then for the plate, this plate of thickness d, though any <laughs> polarization in the y direction is going to develop a phase lag with respect to the polarization in the x direction, because the wave is slower in, in that direction. So <clears throat> after the distance d, so we assume that the, there's no phase difference in the light coming in. <clears throat> After going through, we get a phase difference of, well, let's see. Let me, um, so I have an e to the i k dot x, but I want to write k in terms of the indices of refraction. So let me do that. So k sub i is n sub i times omega over c. I'm just using V as uh, omega over K. V is, uh, yeah, omega over K. So I have a phase difference that I get by taking the ratio of how much the phase advances in the Y direction and divide that by how much the phase advances the exponential uh, changes in the y direction divided by how much it changes in the x direction. And so I get an e to the i times the phase difference, which is n2 minus n1 um, omega over c times d. So, so I'll write that as a phase difference is just n2 minus n1 omega over c times d. So I've just evaluated e to the i kx as the material goes through. So e to the i kx at x equals 0, and then up to x equals d is how much the phase advances in this direction. And this is how much the phase advances in this direction. And of course, they're different by this amount. <clears throat> So let's, uh, let's suppose that we've um, made the width of our device in such a way that n over 2 minus 
n sub one, n two minus n sub one times omega over c times d. Let's suppose we arrange that so that this is pi. It could be some odd multiple of pi too, but uh, you know you could add multiples of two pi to this, or add or subtract multiples of two pi to it, and, and we'll get the same physics out, the same uh, effects out. So this, because it's a half, you know, it's half of two pi, it's called a half wave plate. Uh, which is basically double what, what this is. This, I said, was a quarter wave plate. So the, so the relation was that is equal to pi over two for, for this one. <clears throat> Okay, so let's suppose that we enter this plate, call it a plate, <clears throat> with a linear polarization where the linear polarization is at an angle of theta. That is, I've got in the xy plane, I've got a light beam that's polarized in this direction. So this is where the E field is pointing at some instant. <clears throat> you know, in other instances, it just oscillates back and forth, <clears throat> but along the same direction. So that's a linear polarization at an angle theta with respect to the x-axis, with respect to the n1 axis. <clears throat> so let's see. I can break this up into the components that see the two different indices of refraction. Along here is um, E times cosine theta, and along here, this distance is E sine theta. <clears throat> okay, so what is the effect of the plate? That's what I want to learn. on the polarization, of course. So I'm putting it through some optical element, and that may change the polarization or may not. Okay. Let's see what it does. So let's see. So I have, let me express my linear polarization in this xy basis, because that's what's oriented along the two indices of refraction. So that's a, a suitable basis to use. So along one axis, so along the x-axis, it's cosine theta, and along the y-axis, it's sine theta. So this is my representation for that polarization vector. I've, I've represented it as a unit vector, so I, I haven't included the E on it, but although I could, of course. But so this is just a unit vector along the direction of polarization. So what's going to happen to that? Well, the effect of my plate is going to be some kind of a linear operation on this. Uh, it's, it's changing the phase linearly as you go through in some way. Uh, and so I can represent the plate as a matrix. And what is that matrix going to be? <clears throat> well, it's going to change the phase of the y component with respect to the phase of the x component. And that's all it's going to do. It doesn't do anything else. It just changes the relative phases of the two components. And so if I put a 1 up here, then I have to put an e to the i pi down here. And these off-diagonal elements are 0. 
I'm just changing the phase of the Y component with respect to the phase of the X component. That's all I do. Of course, e to the i pi is equal to minus 1. And so what I do is I'm doing a reflection. So after, oh, x and y, after I'm just getting a component down here. I'm getting, I reflect in the E sine theta component. This angle here is theta. And this is my electric field vector after I've gone through the polarize, after I've gone through the half wave plate. So I've done a reflection across the x axis. And so by using an anisotropic medium like this, I can perform, yeah. Oh, I did, oh, you're right. I, I thought I, I thought I drew it as a, uh, you're absolutely right. This is theta. Okay, thank you. So I can change the polarization with a half wave plate. And we saw the example of the quarter wave plate, which you, you'll analyze yourselves. <coughs> um, and basically, we're, we're using superposition and linearity all over again. Um, this polarization here, the wave, this wave is a superposition of a wave polarized in the y direction and a wave polarized in the x direction. I can look at the, how those two um, subwaves behave in the material and then add them back together again to see what I get in the end. It's all superposition going on. Uh, and, and, uh, and effectively interference, yeah. So that's just by, I, I've just, I, I don't really care, okay? So I could have, I could have written e to the i alpha, e to the i alpha plus pi. So I've just adopted a convention by picking one there. Yeah, then this would change. That's, that's that I could just change this and, and okay. or for example, I could make it a quarter wave plate. To anticipate some homework. Okay. So that's polarization, and it's a lot of fun. These, these things are a lot of fun, and you can get some interesting phenomena out of it. Uh, and I'll let you think some more about them in the homework. So I want to go into another useful conceptual device. How do you pronounce that? You spell it? Yeah, I knew I was going to get it wrong. known as Huygens principle. Uh, and this is a, uh, it's a way of thinking about waves that, that tends to be useful in, in deriving certain properties that waves are going to have. Uh, it's, it's not, you shouldn't think of it as really a very rigorous 
way of thinking. Um, there, you know, as we go on, you, it may occur to you there's some obvious deficiency to, in it, but uh, um, nonetheless, it's, it's it, I mean, it does have some basis, and, and so it's useful in that sense. Um, so we have some wave that has some wave front going along. <laughs> And in particular, we're talking about plane waves here, but we don't have to be. <clears throat> it just gets more complicated if it isn't. <clears throat> so it's useful to regard a wave, a wave front as built out of many what we call wavelet pieces or components. <clears throat> so for example, for our plane wave, <clears throat> for the plane wave, the wave front is a plane. which I'll just draw a two-dimensional representation. So our wave front is a line in two dimensions, but of course it's going into the board, say, and out of the board. K vector is along here. <coughs> and we regard this wave as being built out of some wave that's originally in here. So for every point along, along this line, we associate a wavelet. And so forth. So the plane wave wave front It's described by a plane with k dot x minus uh, omega t is equal to a constant. That's our, that's our plane wave wave front. And we're regarding every point on this wave front to be a source, to be a point source. That is a source of spherical waves coming out of that point. And of course, as these spherical waves come out, they interfere. They're coming out coherently. They in interfere such that what you really end up with is a plane wave propagating. And this is known as Huygens' principle. <clears throat> so according to this principle, From this principle, we deduce that if we shine a wave <clears throat> on some kind of barrier, some kind of opaque barrier that has a hole in it, <clears throat> a fairly small hole. Here's the barrier with a hole in it. And I'm shining my, K, my wave on it. <clears throat> so I'm shining my wave on it. All of, the, all of the little wavelets that hit the barrier get absorbed in the barrier. But there's some wavelets that, get, that hit the hole and get through the hole. And so what happens is that we get We get coming out of this hole, we get a wavelet, a wavelet that's generating a spherical wave. <clears throat> we 
get a plane wave coming in and we get a spherical wave coming out. At least approximately. So this is just propagating out in all directions from the other side of this. So that's a consequence of, uh, of Huygens' principle in this context. And so this is diffraction. So to finish this sentence, spherical wage emerges. You know, I'm saying the hole is pretty small. <clears throat> and this kind of diffractive picture is, is very familiar uh, just from looking at water waves. If you have a, a sort of a linear water wave that hits a barrier that's got a, you know, some rocks, that's got some hole, hole between the rocks, then you get a spherical wave that's coming out the other side. Um, and so we can use Huygens' principle to analyze a bunch of things. In particular, we could use it to uh, obtain Snell's law. Um, I was going to give you a homework problem on that, but I don't think, I think you have enough homework problems. Uh, so I'm probably not going to do that. <clears throat> um, So you can kind of keep in mind if you get confused about something though. When we talk about these slits, you can kind of keep in mind Huygens' principle, uh, even though we're not actually going to resort to Huygens' principle in talking about the slits. We're going to do a more direct calculation. So I want to go on to talking about the slits here. There's a very famous experiment called Young's double slit experiment. And people make much of this in quantum mechanics, uh, which is also just waves of, uh, of particles going through slits and what happens, uh, how you interpret the, uh, the probabilities that you get of observing uh, what happens after you throw particles at a double slit. You know, they're supposed to be particles, so they're not waves, but they are waves, so, uh, so they behave like waves. And, and so we call it, so we're just going to deal with, say, electromagnetic waves here, but this is really the same thing that quantum mechanics does too, even though it may be electrons in the quantum mechanical regime. <coughs> uh, okay, so let me draw a picture. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, so the single slit, we'll talk a little bit about the single slit too, which is of course a simpler case, but that's analyzed in quite a bit of detail in, in the book, and so I'm not going to go through the whole thing with the single slit here. I do want to say what happens in the double slit. So I've got a barrier with two holes in it, and these, these are just, you're supposed to think of this as just a projection of something that goes semi-infinitely uh, out of the board. So they so they're slits instead of just holes. We, we'll look at a hole later. Hole is just a little more complicated in some sense. Okay, so we've got a distance L away from our barrier. We've got a screen. So this is, the width of this barrier is negligible. I'm not going to worry about the width of that. The two slits are separated by a distance A. And I'm putting a plane wave on this at normal incidence. And I have some wavelength um, between wave, wave fronts. Okay. And so what I want to ask is, um, 
what the pattern of light is going to be on this screen here, just like we did up on the, on the wall. <clears throat> so if our incoming wave is coherent, so we'll, we'll assume it's coherent. So the phase of the wave at this slit is the same as the phase of, of the wave at this slit. So starting out, as the waves are just starting to emerge through the slit, they're in phase. So again, by Huygens principle, once I get to this side, the waves are going to come out as spherical waves, and so they're going to propagate in different directions. But you can see that there's a wave coming out here, and once they get far enough like this, for the two waves, there's going to be interference between them. They're going to add and so forth. Uh, depending on the phases. And so what I want to do is I want to calculate what the pattern is on this screen, and that pattern is going to depend on the relative phases of these two waves, because let me turn, as these propagate along and hit the screen at a particular place, the wave from this slit is going to have a different phase than the wave from this slit, and so they're going to interfere somehow, either constructively or destructively. And so I'm going to analyze this by letting this be distance L1, this be distance L2, uh, and so I'm assuming that I have an angle theta with respect to the horizontal axis. Okay, That's going to define this. And I've exaggerated my dimensions here so that you can see it. So in fact, both of these lines have almost the same angle theta. And theta is, is going to be taken to be small eventually. Uh, and so the, main, so the first thing you want to know to figure out what the phase difference is there is what's the difference in the path length. Because that's what's going to tell you the difference in phase. And so this is the difference in path length. If I drop a perpendicular here, <coughs> I'll call that delta L, L2 minus L1. And that's approximately equal to A times sine of theta. Not quite exactly, but it's close. Well, for the conditions of, uh, you know, as long as L is much bigger than A, then that's a good approximation. Okay, so the amplitude if I call this point P of theta, the amplitude at P of theta is I'll call it R, is just some constant that I don't care about. All I want to deal with is the phase. No, I mean, there's some, there's some intensity to the wave, some amplitude to the electric fields. Uh, that's it. That's all I need to do. So I just need to work it out and I'll know what the pattern is as a function of theta. <clears throat> so um, that takes a little bit of trig in algebra. I mean, there's nothing difficult about it. It's just sums and differences of angles that we're going to use. Uh, but we'll do that next time.